Let's talk about the early days of, music, of radio in the 1920s. Who decided how music and which music was going to get on the air? It's a complicated story in a way because early radio started with hobbyists who would put on a recording or they would play the violin. And then when radio became more commercial by the 20s, uh, you had only one radio station, uh, the National Broadcasting Company. Um, uh, and at the same time, you also had advertisers who were producing a lot of radio shows. Um, and it was a complicated uh, sort of dance that NBC and advertisers did between you know, figuring out uh, this is the kind of music that we want on the air, this is the kind of music that's going to sell the product that we want to sell, or this is the kind of music that's going to represent our young and not very reputable industry. Um, so there, there were then and always conflicts about you know, who, who is in control and what kind of music is best to put on the air. That's actually a really interesting way to start the conversation because you know here in the 21st century, I mean, radio is, I mean, everybody knows about radio, but if you go back to the 1920s, it was largely an unproven medium, and I guess it would take, you know, kind of like the person who first ate the oyster, probably take an advertiser to be pretty brave to start putting some of their money off of print and moving it into music and radio. Yeah, it was a big risk. I mean, the, the main trade, trade journal in the early 20th century was called Printer's Inc., which gives you some idea of what people thought advertising was about. Um, and, you know, it was, a tra it was a print medium. I mean, people talked about billboards and other things. There were some other sorts of advertising. But mainly it was a print medium. And it was really hard for advertisers to figure out what to do with radio, what to do with sound, because they thought that sound was much more intrusive than a print advertisement where you could just, <clears throat> you know, if you didn't like it on the, on the newspaper or the magazine page, you could just turn the page. But having sound come into people's living rooms selling goods was thought to be anathema by a lot of people. Um, and the idea of trying to convert notions of print advertising to sound advertising was really complicated. So in the early days, you find lots of people talking about um, music can be the headline for your, uh, for your advertisement. And there was, <coughs> excuse me, there was all these analogies made with print um, to sound because people just didn't know how to conceptualize sound as something that could sell. Uh, did audiences, actually I guess, did the advertisers have any idea who was actually listening to, to these shows. I guess, conversely, did radio stations have an idea? So if we think today, if I were to go into a company and say, if you advertise on my show, this is the audience that I reach, and these are the people that are buying your products. I imagine that really early on, this was kind of a terra incognita. Nobody really knew who was listening, and conversely, what kind of music they were interested in. Yep, that's exactly right. Um, <clears throat> there, were, uh, there was a lot of consternation about you know, who was listening. We're spending all this money on these musicians and all these and you know, engineers, and we don't know what we're getting. Or, whereas, again, with print, people knew. You know, we know that New York Times sells you know, X many tens of thousands of copies in New York City or in this neighborhood or that neighborhood. But with radio, nobody really knew. Uh, so very early on in the, early, in the beginning of radio, in the 1920s, uh, there were contests, there were giveaways, you know, write into us and, give, and we'll give you a free recipe or we'll give you a free um, you know, piece of candy, and, it, and people thought that this was a generous thing to do on the part of advertisers, but actually it was a way to try to figure out who was listening and where they were listening. But also it was a way to try to figure out something about the audience. So early letters from fans were analyzed very closely in terms of quality of paper, quality of penmanship, um, a, amount of education that you could discern, like was the grammar, you know, good in this in these writings? Um, was the grammar poor? Was spelling good? Was spelling poor? All as a way of trying to figure out, you know, who who is our audience? And then of course there are lots of polls about listeners' pr listener preferences. What what do you want to listen to? Um, and uh, uh, polling in a sophisticated way, like we currently think of it, didn't really exist. And li listener polls in particular were very very crude at the beginning. 